Newsnight's Julian O'Halloran has been one of the hundreds of Western journalists covering the past days of unrest in Peking. Over the weekend, he witnessed the killings in and around Tiananmen Square. Here's his eyewitness account. The approach to Tiananmen Square by troops from the west of Peking last night was typical of everything that has followed since then and completely contradicts the Chinese government's claim that its target is a handful of hooligans, criminals and counter-revolutionaries. As the army units approached the centre of the city, they were firing into side streets, killing and injuring scores of incomprehending and unarmed men, women and children. In a few minutes, a city that had been entirely peaceful was being turned not into a battle zone, but a killing ground. When the first armoured vehicles approached Tiananmen Square, people suddenly realised the security forces' deadly intent. It was only then, in fear and anger, that the crowds began to resist hurling any object they could find at the military hardware and making makeshift and totally inadequate barricades. Eventually, one armoured vehicle did by chance get caught up in the iron and concrete obstacles. Hatred of the government and a blend of fury and terror were then translated into a dreadful vengeance exacted on one of the tank's crew as the crowds beat him to death. The authorities have reported that several other troops were killed in such incidents and a thousand injured. But if these figures are true, all our evidence suggests that this has been only a response by the people of Peking to the extraordinary and murderous onslaught that's been launched on them. Firing around the square and in the distance to the south continued during the night. At dawn, more armoured vehicles were moving into Tiananmen Square. Then we could just make out the rubble of the Statue of Democracy, erected by idealistic art students last Tuesday, now destroyed by the hardline forces who have gained the upper hand in China's power struggle. At 8 a.m., there were thousands of people in the avenue of everlasting peace. Some newly arrived to see what was going on in the square. The burning buses expressed the feelings of those who had witnessed the worst of the night's violence. Two hours later, the situation appeared to have stabilized. A crowd of a thousand or more civilians facing a line of troops several deep, about 200 yards from them, at the northeast entrance to the square. As I walked towards that point, accompanied by others, taking what seemed like a leisurely Sunday morning cycle ride or stroll, the troops, without warning, opened up again with a burst of rifle fire lasting a minute or more. We fled down the wide avenue that offered virtually no effective cover. One man, felled by a bullet, was carried past me into a nearby building. The luckier injured were put in ambulances whose crews showed exceptional courage. As troops opened up again in our direction half an hour later, this time with bursts of automatic fire, the injured and dying were loaded onto cycle trailers to be ferried to a hospital half a mile away. These scenes were to be repeated for much of the day, as the numbers of dead and wounded vastly outnumbered the ambulances available. While many had been shot, others had been beaten, clubbed or stoned by troops making forays into the crowd. And as the day progressed, it became clear there had been similar carnage on an equal or greater scale in other areas of the city. That report was sent earlier, and Julian O'Halloran now joins us live from Peking. Julian, what's the latest news you have for us from Peking? Well, I've heard within the last few minutes of a statement, uh, I believe, on Peking Radio, 
uh, quoting the Chinese government as justifying the army's action of Saturday night and Sunday morning, and indeed the whole of yesterday, on the basis that if it had not taken place, there would have been more loss of blood, the chaos would have spread, and there would have been even more bloody incidents. The situation on the streets this morning is that overnight uh, there has been very little on the streets whatsoever, and uh, this morning there are cyclists, very little traffic. There's been a call for uh, a strike by the students to commemorate what they're calling the June the 4th massacre, and uh, some people I've spoken to have predicted that a large number of people will stay away from work, although some clearly are uh, venturing out despite the dangers to them. Uh, on the avenue of everlasting peace within the last few hours there have been tanks and armored vehicles going up and down troops casually spraying gunfire into nearby buildings and there's been shooting within the vicinity of where i am that is about uh, half a mile from the avenue of everlasting peace we, shooting, i would say within the last hour and a half or two we know of the divisions among the political leadership over the past few weeks julian is there any evidence of divisions within the people's liberation army itself i have heard one or two reports from individuals quoting their friends in other parts of peking suggesting that some of the troops who were brought in on saturday night uh, would not act against the population, uh, even gave their weapons to students or other activists, uh, fraternized with people, sat down, etc. I've not been able to confirm any of those reports. Julian, thank you very much for joining us. Well, nowhere has the unfolding carnage on the streets of Peking been watched more closely, closely than in Hong Kong. Today it's a British Crown colony, but under an agreement reached by Britain and China in 1984, there's supposed to be an orderly transition towards Chinese rule by 1997. Today there were massive demonstrations in Hong Kong, tinged with mourning, fear and despair over the future. Prominent local politicians said they will not work towards the drafting of the colony's new constitution while Li Peng rules in Peking. The colony's governor, Sir David Wilson, spoke of his shock and deep sadness over the events in Peking. Earlier today, I spoke to Britain's Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe, about the implications of the weekend's events for Hong Kong. I began by asking him what the British government intended to do in reaction to the killings in Peking. We've made, already made our position clear to the Chinese government and with the other members of the European community and the rest of the international community we shall be expressing our sense of shock and urging the Chinese leadership really to come to their senses. Uh, it simply isn't possible in today's world to bring matters to a conclusion by confrontation and by the imposition of force. That's a message that's got through even to many parts of the communist world and it must get through, as I think it should, to the leadership in China. Should Britain consider now some kind of sanctions against the Peking government, perhaps in concert with the European allies and the United States? Is that premature at the moment? It's much too early to be thought, thinking in those terms. And in any event, China is such a huge, vast country, uh, so inward-looking in many ways, that the outside world can have a, only a limited impact on it. But I think the important thing is that these events show that the encouraging signs of improvement in East-West relations uh, shouldn't allow us to forget that there are still great big gaps between the democratic world and the communist world. And that even in China, where a lot had been happening in the right direction, uh, the forces of old-fashioned reaction are still there in, in strength. We must hope and urge that they uh, are not the ones that prevail. There are, as I say, many people with whom we've dealt over the last, last few years who f see fully how China needs to move ahead in political terms, move ahead in economic terms, and that struggle, I dare say, is still taking place. Meanwhile, it's shocking and appalling and dreadful that people have been uh, slaughtered so indiscriminately. Paddy Ashton, the Democrats' leader, said that the agreement with the Chinese was an act of faith, and because the trust had evaporated between Britain and China, we should now stop negotiations. Well, plainly, what happens in the immediate future depends upon what's happening in China in the immediate future. Uh, at this stage, had it not been for these awful events, Work was still going on in, in translating the agreement into the basic law of the Chinese constitution. And that has been uh, put on ice while all these troubles are taking place. But it's much too soon to conclude that, that we should set all that to one side. Because Hong Kong's future is inextricably bound up 
geographically and historically with that of main China. What we've got to do is to remind the Chinese, as I'm sure they will recall, that the agreement made was in their interests, in the interests of China, as well as in the interests of Hong Kong and Britain, and try and bring them back to understand the importance of standing by the obligations which they entered into. I know that sounds hollow and, 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 and worrying at this stage, but that is the reality we've got to get back to. And we must hope very much that the violent events of the last few days and, and weeks do not represent the long-term character of the China with which we shall have to deal. But isn't British diplomacy marked by a pursuit of British values as well as British interests? And those values are democracy, human rights, and so on. And shouldn't we impress that clearly on the Chinese government? Well, I think the most interesting thing is that it isn't just British values. In the world in the last 10 years, human values, human rights, have assumed a much wider importance. Uh, the world is no longer a, a set of closed societies. Uh, it's very difficult to believe that in China, in Georgia, in Poland, in Russia, it will be possible to recreate these secret worlds of violence and tyranny. I think today we've got one world, one standard, the standard of human rights that we've been preaching from the West for a long time, is much more widely understood. And we must hope that it will prevail. I shall be talking later on tonight on the World Service. I hope my voice will be getting through to the people in the government of China, to people who know me, who know Britain, that they will be reacting to this message, that if China has been, as it were, rejoining the rest of the world, and we've all been welcoming it, the rest of the world is still waiting to have her as part of the human race. We'd love to see her reasserting her respect for human rights. Sir Geoffrey Howe speaking earlier. Well, joining me now from Southampton is the former Prime Minister Edward Heath in London, the Shadow Foreign Secretary Gerald Kaufman, and from Connecticut, Dr Henry Kissinger, who helped create the climate by which the Chinese government opened up to the world in the 1970s. Dr Kissinger, what does this extraordinary carnage on the streets of Peking tell you about the nature of Li Peng's government? Does, does it suggest he's in a strong position or, in fact, in a weak position? Well... Uh, it's a tragedy uh, in the sense that this is almost the last thing that he could have wanted. He has been the chief engine of reform in China. He was uh, arrested by Mao uh, twice uh, and called a capitalist roader and a party splitter. And now at the end of his life, he sees himself in a position in which the uh, people's army is shooting at its own people. Uh, it, and he's had to bring back uh, many of the old men that he had pushed to the sideline in his drive for reform. So I think uh, it is uh, a morally weak position and, uh, and in a way a very sad position for Deng Xiaoping, who uh, could have gone down in history as one of the great Chinese reformers. Mr. Heath in Southampton, do you agree that it is ironic that Deng Xiaoping, who himself is regarded as one of the, the world's great reformers, now should be regarded perhaps as a butcher. Yes, it's a shattering blow, I think, to all those who have um, tried to help the People's Republic to develop. And uh, I think it's a little early yet to come to a, a final judgment about Deng Xiaoping and the others who have obviously been involved in this behind the scenes. One of the uh, regrettable things is that Beijing has not yet learned that it has to explain its policy as it goes along, which is something which Gorbachev has learned in, in Moscow. And uh, there has really been nothing until this last report, which we heard a few minutes ago, as to what's really been uh, going on or any explanation of affairs to their own people. Of course, there's one deeper thing than this, which is that the economic reforms in the People's Republic have really been very considerable, and they've been helped by capital investment from America, from Europe, and uh, from Japan. But at the same time, uh, it has been difficult to carry on political reforms. And uh, all history shows us that when you have economic development, then very quickly political development is demanded after it. Now, of course, China's got great problems because they've got over a thousand million people uh, to organize in a political society. But I think that uh, what we've seen in Beijing was an expression of those who want to see political reforms. I'm not sure that they're thinking in terms of our democracy. They were singing the international, and that doesn't really go along with our method of thought or, or, or carrying on democracy. But I think this is one sign of the fact that uh, 
economic development, which has already been achieved, is now being followed by a demand for political development. Mr Kaufman, is it your judgment that the worst is now over in Peking, or do you suspect, as our correspondent Julian O'Halloran was suggesting earlier, that the army may be divided against itself and there could be worse to come? The problem <coughs> of trying to assess what's going on is that the action seems to be um, irrational, that the clear objective which one could understand, even though one was totally appalled by the methods employed of clearing the square, and the government taking over control of the centre of its own capital. As I say, one can understand it, horrifying as the method was that was employed. But now that having been done, they still seem to be going on. They still seem to be shooting and killing without any reason of any kind, even by their own criteria. Whether there's a division within the army with some units not wanting to fire on the people and others having been brought from very distant areas to do the job may well be a possibility. But what is clear is that the um, authorities in Beijing have decided that they cannot stand the humiliation of their own capital not being under their own control and they have gone immeasurably too far in uh, retrieving control. I believe the control will be retained, but the price internally very, is very high, and the price ex externally is even higher, because as Mr Heath has pointed out, one of the most important and promising aspects of what has been going on in China is the contacts and the joint ventures with outside capitalist companies, and they will be thinking again, I'm sure. Dr. Kissinger, what do you make of the statement by the Chinese government in the past few minutes that they intervened because otherwise there would have been more loss of blood? If we had not taken this action, the chaos would not have settled down and more and even bigger bloody incidents would have taken place, they're saying. I can't judge this, but I agree, I agree with what Mr. Kaufman said, that the humiliation of not having their own capital in their own, under their control of having statues erected in the main square that were uh, challenging the fundamental political system was obviously too much uh, for uh, the governing group in China. Uh, but again, we have to remember that the, uh, that the unrest was generated by the success of the economic reforms and by uh, the slowness in creating political change to go with the economic reform. So the, the dilemma that the Chinese government has faced is uh, to have politics stay uh, in step with the economic reform. And uh, when one has to govern a billion people, that is a, very, uh, that is a very difficult problem. And in the future, what we have to observe now is whether Deng Xiaoping, having a, a reasserted control of his capital, will go back to his original reforming system uh, reforming approach and perhaps extend to the political field what he has already done in the economic field. That is what I think the outside world should work for. Dr. Kissinger, could I pursue that point? How should the West react? It's obvious that there has been condemnation, there have been many hard words against the Chinese government today, Deng Xiaoping and Li Peng, but should we consider any kind of sanctions against the Chinese government or would that simply be counterproductive, turning the Chinese government inward again? In my view, that would be uh, counterproductive and would turn the Chinese government inward. Uh, it would change the whole uh, political uh, balance of forces in Asia. And uh, they may drive us to that uh, if, uh, if, it, if the uh, repression uh, goes on. But it is a step that we should not uh, take uh, very easily. In fact, we should take it with great hesitation. China is too important a country. Uh, for us to drive it back into isolation or maybe towards the Soviet Union and it would change all relationships in the world that have been built up since the 70s. Dr. Kissinger, thank you very much. I understand we're now about to lose our American satellite. Mr. Heath, can I pursue the point with you? Do you think there will be any demand from the House of Commons this week when they debate the issue of China, as I understand it, for any kind of economic sanctions or is that seen in, in Dr. Kissinger's view as in Dr. Kissinger's view as being purely counterproductive? I wouldn't have thought the House of Commons would demand sanctions for one moment, no. Uh, part for Dr. Kissinger's views, and uh, in part because it's almost impossible to apply in any case. What uh, surely we need to do is to try to influence the government of the People's Republic uh, 
uh, to move towards political development and uh, to quieten some of the demands which are being made in other cities as well as Beijing. And in particular, of course, to uh, deal with this problem of corruption, which has become so prominent in the last few weeks. I think we ought to encourage them to deal with that. And that's a much better way of going about it than trying to apply sanctions, which in any case would be quite pointless. Mr. Kaufman, what sort of leverage do you think the Western democracies really have with the Peking government? Clearly, the uh, Chinese government very much wants close links with Western governments, with the United States, with Britain, with others, because they want them to join in joint ventures with them and investing in China in the huge economic development in the special economic zones that anybody who's recently been to China has been able to see for themselves. The last thing the Chinese want is for the West to turn its back on them, just as the last thing we want is for them to turn their backs on us. It's a very important balance that we've got to strike. On the one hand, we have to make clear without any prevarication of any kind how totally we condemn what has been going on in the Chinese capital in the last 48 hours. On the other hand, we don't want them to wash their hands of us so that we don't have any vestigial uh, influence over them. After one of the most astonishing things of this whole terrible episode is that we've seen it, that even amid all this turmoil, China has been open enough for Western correspondents to be there and send stories out. Mr. Heath, what does this suggest for the future of Hong Kong? There will be people in the United Kingdom as well as in the colony itself who will be extremely worried at the prospect of handing Hong Kong back to a Chinese government which can treat its own citizens in this way. Yes, I can understand people being worried about that. And it was quite natural in Hong Kong itself there should be demonstrations. But I would beg the people of Hong Kong now, having made that demonstration, uh, to return to their work, not to go for strikes, and not to think that they can line up with the students in Beijing. Hong Kong's got its own life, very important life, and uh, a very successful commercial operation, and one doesn't want that damaged in any way. Uh, if they were to try to follow the path of those in Beijing, then all they would be doing would be harming Hong Kong's present as well as its future. Well, now, from the point of view of the 1997 treaty, this is an arrangement which has been entered into by the British government, quite rightly, uh, because the treaty ends in 1997, and nothing that we say or do can alter that historical fact. What we do want to do is to ensure, as the Chinese have already given an assurance, that in 1997 Hong Kong will be able to pursue its own political path. Now, as far as I'm concerned, of course, uh, what I would say to the governor and to the British government is what I said more than 18 months ago, that we ought to have moved much faster in Hong Kong in giving representative government to the Hong Kong people. And instead of waiting until uh, two or three years hence before we get a further elected part of the government of Hong Kong, we ought to do it this year, 89. And I'm, I, I'm still of that view. And I believe it could be done. Joe Kaufman, do you agree on that point, that Britain Ye has been too slow? Yes, it? indeed, Mr Heath and I said the same things in the same debate. Uh, we both of us said that we should have had these elections, that we should have had them, in fact, last year, which was when we were recommending them. But and what that a higher would it make, proportion given, given the way in which the Chinese treat any pro-democracy demonstrations, well, because, they would regard because them... Because it would have been established the Chinese would have been taking over in 1997. Let's be clear, whatever Mr. Ashdown or anybody else says, Hong Kong will be transferred to China in 1997. We would have had several years of going democracy, elective democracy, for the Chinese to take over and if they were against it, have publicly to dismantle. That was the great error that Sir Geoffrey and the government made, even though I praise Sir Geoffrey and the government for the original joint declaration with the Chinese. What we've got to make sure now is that despite this appalling situation, and I agree again with Mr. Heath, the misgivings of the Hong Kong pe people are perfectly understandable, we've got to go on working with China to get a basic law which will be acceptable to the people of Hong Kong and give them confidence. Final word from Mr. Heath, you, do you agree that we must continue to work with China even though the government is capable of doing such things? Yes, I do, because we mustn't draw the immediate conclusion uh, 
that the government of China is incapable of learning lessons from this ghastly tragedy. Uh, one of the things, of course, which must have struck many people is the way in which the army was in fact really out of control. Uh, if one looks back over the past three or four weeks, then one can see now many errors which were committed. Uh, probably the students ought to have been told to go home before Mr. Gorbachev arrived. Uh, it was because the leadership didn't want to interfere in any way with uh, what was going on while he was there that no action was taken. Then the first forces used were the local Beijing forces. Well, they will never take action against Beijing people. So it was then that they sent for the forces from the north. But they seemed to be completely out of control with no knowledge of, at all of how to deal with a situation of this kind. Now, one mustn't assume that the uh, government in Beijing is not going to learn any lessons from all of this. And our task again should be to use all our influence possible to make sure they do learn the lessons. And this doesn't reoccur. And Hong Kong can then have more, more confidence in what is going to happen in 1997. Mr. Heath, thank you very much. Mr. Kaufman, thank you. We've just got time.